is a passage in the teachings of Ajahn Dun. Describes an incident when a woman came to him with just pouring out her soul about problems in her family, worried about her son, worried about this, worried about that. And so he tried to console her as best he could. And then after she left, he commented to one of his students, he said, people these days suffer because of their thinking. It's interesting the way he said that, people these days, as if people in the past didn't suffer from their thinking. Maybe it meant that prior to that time, Thailand was poor and most people were just worried about eating, surviving. Now that people have become more wealthy, food was easier to get, jobs were easier to get, their thinking took over, and that was what made them suffer. And this is certainly true in spades about people in the modern world. Because there's so much in the modern world that teaches, harm, teaches us harmful ways of thinking. The mass media are predicated on the idea that you are lacking and you need what we've got to sell. That's the message they're constantly trying to get through to you. And when you're exposed to that message long enough, you start believing it. And so the first step is to get away from the media. So the message isn't being drummed into you all the time. But even then, once you've been used to thinking in those terms, it's hard to get out. This is why we have to train the mind. There are basically two ways of approaching the problem. One is to stop thinking, and the other is to learn to think in different ways, ways that are actually helpful to you, to put an end to suffering rather than piling on more suffering. And as a meditator, you've got to learn how to use both approaches. I mean, learning to let the mind rest so it doesn't have to be occupied with thoughts all the time. And then when the time comes when you really do have to think, learning how to think in ways that are really helpful rather than harmful. And even when you're trying to get the mind to be still, it requires a certain amount of thought beforehand. You've got to convince yourself this is a worthwhile activity, sitting here, focusing on your breath, letting the breath be comfortable, trying not to force the breath too much, just noticing what kind of rhythm of breathing feels good right now. This requires some thought, but it's constructive thought. It's okay to think and question about this issue, because that kind of thinking and questioning gets the breath more comfortable, gets you more absorbed in this process. It's not a matter of forcing the mind to stay with the breath, no matter what. If you put too much force in the mind like that, it's going to rebel. It's like trying to hold a beach ball underwater. As soon as your grip loosens up a bit, the ball goes shooting up out of the water. What you've got to learn is how to get the mind interested in the breath. Realize this energy in the body that goes along with the breathing. That's an important part of what keeps the body healthy. Not just alive, but also healthy. If the energy flows smoothly, if all the nerves in the body get bathed in the breath, that's going to be good for the body. And when the body's more comfortable like that, it's easier to settle down and stay right here. It feels good. There's a sense of fullness, a sense of ease that you can develop, just like just by thinking of that energy flowing through the body all the time. As soon as the breath starts coming in, the energy is already flowing through all the nerves. As soon as it goes out, it's dispersing out through all the pores of the body. Thinking in this way helps the mind to settle down and gives it a place to rest when it doesn't have to think. But there'll be a part of your mind saying, what are you doing? This is a waste of time. You've got all this you've got to worry about, all that you've got to worry about. 
And sometimes you just say, no, I'm sorry, this is not the time for that, and it'll stop. Other times, though, you've got to reason with the mind. This is why we have the chats before the meditation. This is why the, the Buddha has so, has so many discourses to give you the perspective to realize that it really is important to train the mind. And this is the most important thing you can do in life. And as for all the other issues you might carry around with you, you've got to learn how to look at those from a distant perspective. All too often we're much too close to the issues in our lives, dealing with issues in our family and issues at work, our own frustration with ourselves. When you get too entangled in these issues, it's hard to get a perspective. So the purpose of the Dharma is to help give you a perspective, to help you to step back and look at these issues in the long term. You get a better sense of what's really important in life and what's not important in life. The Buddha talks about four guardian meditations. These are actually things to think about if you have trouble getting the mind to settle down. The four topics you can think about. One is the Buddha, and the different ways you can think about the Buddha. If you find that the mind needs some consoling and some reassuring, in other words, it needs some gentle treatment, just think about the fact that the Buddha proved with his life it is possible for human beings to find true happiness. That's the basic message that his life sends, and it's an important message. Because for most of us, we look at human life and what is it? People get born, they spend all, go to all this trouble to get an education. Some people get married, have kids. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't work out. And then what happens? They get old. The body stops functioning. And sometimes death and illness are not a quick thing. They're these long, lingering illnesses, and then they die. And you wonder, what is that all about? all that needless suffering. And you look around and that seems to be everybody's life. Well, the Buddha's life story is very different. He found that it's possible through your own efforts to attain a happiness that's not affected by aging, illness, and death. In other words, there's a part of the mind that lies beyond these things. I mean, you can look at aging, illness, and death as little things. It also helps get a lot of the other issues in your day-to-day -day life. It helps you see them as little things as well. And to remind you, it is possible to find happiness. It may take a long time, but it's that possibility is there. Things are not hopeless. That's one way of thinking about the Buddha. Now, if you find that you're getting lazy in your practice, the other way you can think about the Buddha is reminding yourself the Buddha was here 2,600 years ago teaching this lesson. You were probably here someplace too. Why didn't you take the lesson to heart back then? Why are you still hanging around now? How much longer is it going to take you? It's very rare that we have Buddhas in this world. They talk about how many thousands of years it's going to be before the next Buddha appears, and in the meantime his teachings are going to be forgotten, and then what are you going to do? And you think in this way it gives you gives a little more oomph to your practice, more encouragement to put more effort in. So you can think about the Buddha in, either in a way that's consoling or in a way that lights a fire under you. to look at your state of mind and see which way of thinking about the Buddha is helpful right now, and then apply that. This is one of the big tragedies of human life, is that we have this power to think, and yet for the most part it just seems your mind seems to have a mind of its own. A topic can absorb you and obsess you, and it seems like it's got hold of you and won't let you go. Actually, that's not the problem. You, you're holding on to the thinking, even the thinking that seems to be most frustrating and the most maddening. 
there's one part of the mind that actually gets some pleasure out of it. Otherwise, it wouldn't hold on. In the sense that maybe that it has, to, it has to do this kind of thinking, or it has to browbeat itself, or whatever. You've got to learn how to question that. See, what, what pleasure am I getting out of this thought, thinking that's driving me crazy? To what sense do I feel I have to do it? That there's going to be a reward for me somehow if I do this obsessive thinking. Look into that. And when you can catch sight of it, then it's a lot easier to let go. The other three guardian meditations operate on a similar principle. You can think about them in ways that are consoling or in ways that give you a little more of a push. Thoughts of goodwill. It's good to think thoughts of just wishing happiness for everybody, starting with yourself and then spreading it around, because this is a kind of thought that holds no harm. It reminds you, you, know, you don't get any advantage from anybody else's suffering, so why would you want to wish suffering on anyone else? Again, this helps give you perspective on the issues of life. Particularly if there's a cycle of revenge in some place in your life. This helps pull you out. Helps you step back. Of course, the more stringent side of metta is they say, well, if you really do wish yourself happiness, what are you doing? Why are you living this way? Why do you do these things? Why do you say these things? Why do you think these things? Thoughts of goodwill can act as a to make a comparison with a carrot and a stick. Sometimes it's a carrot, sometimes it's a stick. If you were really serious about your happiness, you'd change the way you live. Sometimes it's useful to think in those ways. The third guardian meditation, the foulness of the body. You can think about that in a consoling way or a more stringent way. The consoling way is to remind yourself that all these big issues in life, so many of them are based on meeting the needs of the body. But look at the body. What is it? Just a few organs that are going to function together for a while, and then it's all going to fall apart. And a lot of these big issues around the body are really not all that important. Why make the body such a big deal? And as for the stringent side, when you see that you really are attached to the body, ask yourself, well, what is in here in the body that's really worth being proud about? The Buddha once said, after cataloging all the different things that the body does, all the stuff inside the body. And then what happens to the body as it ages and, and dies? So whoever would think of exalting themselves and disparaging them others on the basis of the body. In other words, your body is stronger, your body is more fit, your body is more beautiful, whatever. If you think in those terms, he says, what is that if not madness? recollection of death functions in two ways as well. The consoling side is that whatever the issues you have in life, there's going to come a time when they don't matter anymore. You pass away, the other person, other people pass away, and it's all going to be forgotten. So the issues that seem to loom so large in your life right now, you can look at them as something a lot smaller. They're not so overwhelming. On the other hand, you can use the think th thoughts about death to realize that you don't know when you're going to die. The Buddha has his, his disciples reflect every evening on sunset. This may be the last sunset you ever see. 
Are you ready to go? Well, the answer usually is no. The question is, okay, what can you do in the meantime? How can you best prepare your mind? Well, the best thing you can do is to train the mind to have more mindfulness, more discernment, more alertness. So if death does come, okay, you're not, the mind doesn't have to suffer. Yes, you think the same way every morning at sunrise. This may be your last sunrise. Are you ready to go? Well, if not, train your mind. It's not the case that when death comes we have no way of helping the situation. Okay, the body may die, but the mind doesn't have to suffer with the body's death. If you're mindful enough, if you have enough concentration, if you have enough alertness and discernment. So work on building these things. It's in this way that thinking can help you. It gives you the right attitude. The question is learning how to apply these different topics in a way that's appropriate for your needs right now. That requires learning how to look at your own mind and say, okay, what does the mind need? It's usually a good principle, rule of thumb, is to start with the more consoling side and see if that works. It gives you the energy you need to practice. If the consoling side doesn't work, you can use the more stringent side, see if that works. Once you see that the mind is willing to drop all of its outside concerns and settle down, okay, then you can drop that thinking and just be with the stillness. This is a lot of the meditation. It goes back and forth between being still and thinking, investigating, and then being still again. Investigating, being still again. The more solid your concentration, the more subtle your thinking can be, the more subtle your powers of observation and analysis in the present moment can be. Meditation practice is not just a matter of forcing the mind to be still. You've got to learn how to reason with it so it can let go at least enough so the mind can settle down for a while. Then once it's settled down for a while, then you can reason with it again so it can let go even more of more subtle things. The things you missed when the mind was bouncing all over the place like a ping pong ball. Now that it's more still, you can begin to see more subtle attachments. Well, learn how to investigate those. Then when you let go of those, the mind will be still on an even deeper level. Learn how to pursue it back and forth like this, thinking and being still, thinking and being still. So these two processes can help each other along. When you understand the meditation in this way, you the results go a lot deeper. And they really do help you find that happiness that the Buddha, the Buddha found. The happiness that isn't dependent on anything at all. It just simply is. It's there. The potential is already there in the mind. It's simply learning how to use the faculties of the mind, its ability to be still, its ability to investigate, its ability to think. How to use these faculties in a way that really is helpful, rather than the normal everyday way that we use them and just piles more suffering on, on top of ourselves. So look at your mind right now and see what it needs. Does it need consoling? Does it need, does it need the stick rather than the carrot? Or is it ready just to settle down? Learn to observe your mind and then provide it what it needs.